Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Guru. And for Guru today, we got a very, very good guest. And he's a, he's a great actor. He's been in, in numerous, numerous films and numerous shorts and a couple horror stuff. And we're going to talk to him a bit about horror as well. And his name is Ryan Man Manuel. And I am Rocco Cross. I am the host at Stutters. I am the host of the Guru Room. And Ryan is coming up next. All right. Um, welcome, welcome to Gru, and thank you so so much again for for coming on and being a guest on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Definitely, definitely. So uh you, you know, as as you know, because we've been talking for a while now so as as you know i'm a big horror fan and i run a horror show and a horror site and all that fun fun stuff so wanted to start the interview off by asking you what are some of your favorite horror movies to watch and why you chose them <laughs> Ooh, uh, I, I was i was really uh as a kid i was huge into horror you know probably like i was way too young some of those movies that i probably shouldn't have been watching um and i i took i took the love of the genre well 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 into my 30s and then i got married and my wife really can't do horror so the past couple of years i've really i've really like slipped behind um some of my favorites though this one i'm gonna a little bit lame the exorcist of course you know that's a great movie um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those ones, but it's like saying, like, The Godfather's your favorite movie, like, it's everyone's favorite, so it's like, but I mean, it, I, I guess I always hear that, like, about 60s and 70s, like, horror classics, mm -hmm. you know, people say, oh, watch the, it's scary, and then you kind of, like, uh, but that one, I feel like The Exorcist, that one actually holds up, you know what I mean, oh, like, it, it really, it deserves it it's space as as a classic you know where i feel like a lot of them they show their age and they're really not that scary because i guess i guess like anything else like the genre had to scare people and then they get a certain tolerance you gotta you know what i mean you go mm -hmm. from night of living dead to human centipede you gotta keep upping the ante and that's where we're at now um so yeah the, the exorcist and I remember the last time we talked, uh, Night of the Demons yes. uh, was like both of, like in our yes. favorite. For me, I don't know if it's hard for me to favorite, but it's like in the top five, maybe top ten, you Isn't know, like it's up movie, there. Um, it's such a great horror movie. It is. Like, it, 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 oh my God, I love that movie. And I think the last time we talked, I was I was telling you that I interviewed both of the the girls from the movie, both both of the head head demons. And Angela, which is a uh, a uh, Mil Milia Kincaid, and Quig Quigley, who's who's also in Return of the Living Dead and all that. That that was an yeah, Return of the Living Dead ah uh, is another franchise. But yeah, they're they're still like they're still they're aware, you know, that it became something bigger than they ever expected, and they're still going to conventions and stuff. And that's something that was great about the '80s, because in the '80s they they just made a movie, you know, here's a horror movie, teenagers get in trouble, you know what I mean? Like it's not groundbreak, it's not Tenant, you know. It's, it, but what would happen is people like you and I would kind of gravitate to it and, and in some way say like, oh, I, as a kid, I watched it over and over. It would, mm -hmm. you know, define your childhood in some ways. And what they're doing now, sort of like with Sharknado and, and yeah. all that is like, they're trying to make these like campy classics. They're, they're trying to make them bad and, and stuff. And but what I miss is the age where it was, it was innocent. They tried their best to make a good movie and they would, you know, come up short in the, it would be, you get troll, troll too, you know, you oh get hilarious, God, yes. but, but you have to try to make a good movie. You, can, you can't try to make a bad movie, you know, <laughs> then you get what you get. Um, so yeah, I, I think Night of the Demons was great. And it was great that as time has gone on, you talk to someone else and be like, oh yeah, that too. Cause it wasn't, it didn't have as high of a profile as well, like yeah. the Freddy movies, the Jason yeah. movies. 
it, it was it was an uptick in terms of popularity, yet mm -hmm. it still exists, and I, I love that. Uh, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of George Romero and nice. the 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 Night Day Dawn, and I even like um, Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. You know, okay. I, I felt like he 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 did this. Um, the new one, Army of the Dead. Yeah, that, that one I've I've got about halfway through. I just sort of feel like I've seen it before. Right. You know right, exactly. That's how I felt too. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't a fan. It, it's like it's not bad, but it just feels like it's retread old ground. And I think he was trying to do something interesting style-wise, but instead it just sort of felt gimmicky. Mm -hmm. Um. But anyway, yeah, so uh, I, I love, I, I still watch the Romero movies. I remember as a kid just really being blown away, not, not by the creature, the zombie, but by the fact that overnight the world sort of turns on its head yes, and yes. suddenly, you know, society collapses. And as, as a kid, I found that fascinating. And now as adults, after the 2020 pandemic, it's not so funny anymore, but like, yeah, no, it's you know, it started to get a bit too real, you know, like some of, some of the stuff there. Uh, but, but actually in some ways, it's like, you know, those, those movies always had that popularity. And I do believe it's not because the zombie is an interesting creature. It's because it proposes that, like, what does that look like when you don't go to school anymore? You don't, yeah. When everything is about survival, the world is just turned inside out and you know you're re and i think people are fascinated by that and that's why you'd see something like the walking dead kind uh, of yeah. come, come into play you know um so it's weird that we this year we came neck and neck with a kind of apocalyptic i know thing. isn't that crazy yeah and i i think you know army of the dead aside i have a feeling that there's not going to be as many like apocalypse type things <laughs> only because it's not as much of a fantasy anymore. I mean, you watch movies to kind of escape your reality. So right. really escaping our reality. If, um, plus, honestly, I think that genre was, it was getting a little saturated anyway. You know, it kind of reached its- I agree. Like, All right. And then, and then 2020 happened. So I wouldn't be surprised if we started just seeing more sitcoms or something. <laughs> Horror might take a, a step back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the Exorcist, uh, uh, Night of the Demons, uh, George Romero, and then when we get into the '90s, I really liked uh, Event Horizon. Yeah, that, that yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Kind of cheesy, but yeah, but uh, it was it was it was good. It's like a mixture of horror and sci sci-fi. That's yeah. I don't think we'd seen that too much. Mm -hmm. Usually, I think back in the day, if they went in the direction of sci-fi, it would be something like Star Wars. Yeah, or yeah. it might even have a higher concept. But they didn't usually marry it with horror quite like that. And I, I like the idea of the the visions of hell that they had. You know, exactly. like outside of a Nine Inch Nails music video, you kind of didn't. <laughs> that kind of image of maggots coming out of people not in mainstream <laughs> movies that kind of like and try and literally trying to like shock you with the flashing images like it's trying to get in your head like it's like that, this movie's evil man you know <laughs> yeah that, that that one i i have to watch every once in a while i gotta go back and watch so that's that's way up there too um and i'm actually doing a horror movie in a couple days you are. Which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, I I wish I could talk more about it, uh, but it looks like they're trying to put it on like Alter, Crypt TV, uh, things Gosh. like that. So it's going to be a horror short. And because of that, I can't talk too much about what it's, you know, because it's like, oh, what's the scary thing? It's kind of a surprise. It's hard to talk about the plot without, you know, giving away <laughs> a surprise. But I thought I, I definitely could have a that. You know, I was like, oh, I got to tell them. Oh my God, that's so awesome! Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm. Excited. I haven't. I haven't done uh, too much horror. Uh, so, so yeah, kind of getting in there a little bit more is nice. Of course, like horror is so much fun. Like, and and plus, like the I think I was telling tell, telling you the last time that we spoke. Um, the fan base for horror movies is so huge and the fans are so loyal and you you see this when you go to horror conventions and horror film festivals 
the the fans will remember a horror movie that you were in say in like 1981 or something and it, it never made any money it, it never moved off the shelf but yet you would have like a cult following of fans that watch the movie over and over well, that's how loyal the horror fans are you're right i i think in some ways maybe it's not a fair comparison but in some ways you might have your marvel heads your dc oh, yeah. heads that have yeah. that kind of like loyalty but I feel like it's like an unfair advantage because they have the comic books and the lore they kind of had something to support it before it got so big and and horror doesn't have that it lives and dies just by what it is and you're right I can't think of another genre where people will have this kind of encyclopedic knowledge yes you know which by the way I, I used to have that I used to be able to like be a human IMDB Nice. But now it's so much harder. You know, you have you have your Amazon Prime, your Netflix, you have hits on YouTube, like mm -hmm. trying to uh, know everything that's out there. It's it's kind of an impossible oh task. God. But for a while there, you could kind of stay on top of it. You could be aware of pretty much everything. You know, now it's it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you were in. Um one one like the the very first things you did was a horror tour called bliss right that that had elements of horror i uh did you ever see requiem for a dream yes yes do you remember the part where she's kind of detoxing or spun out from the the speed mm -hmm. the mother character mm -hmm. and you had these nightmarish kind of grotesque images of the fridge like exactly. opening and closing the lights flashing the game shows all twisted you know she sees another version of herself that's like ghostly and i just remember watching that thinking like i think aronofsky should do a horror movie because it's supposed to be indie, you know, and it's, it's in that moment, it's supposed to just kind of capture her psyche. But mm -hmm. I'm like, if this guy just really tried to scare you, if he made that the purpose of a movie, he'd do well. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Bliss is has similar themes in terms of like addiction and detox. It's supposed to be this like fictional drug that makes heroin look like marijuana. Like it just, oh, it, it's it just, yeah, it's on its own. And, but because of that, it's so addictive. So if you do it once and then you don't get your dose, you're, you know, practically insane. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, it has, it has elements of horror. And then um, slightly before that, I did more of a horror comedy with zombies. Um, and and it's, it's funny, it was, it was years ago, because since then i've seen things come out that are really similar but uh it was a little bit like entourage where okay. it, it has that meta like it's, it's movie about movies you yeah. know yeah. and so you have actors playing parts you have actors that are playing themselves and uh it's it's basically this idea i think there was some someone told me i haven't seen it there's something called one shot of the dead that that has a similar plot I wrote it right around the time that Tropic Thunder came out, and that's what scared me, because you had that same idea where it's actors that suddenly find themselves in the movie that they're making. Mm -hmm. And is it real? How much of it is real? And that's what I have is these people set out to make a zombie movie. They get attacked by real zombies. Some of them figure it out, some of them don't, and, and all that. And so that was definitely something where I wanted, like that Shaun of the Dead. Like there's some parts yeah. that'll be scary, some parts that are funny, some parts where they come together. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So that that was definitely uh, the, the the Grindhouse thing when mm. uh, Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino yes. they kind of like reinvigorated that retro horror. I was kind of like on board with that, and so I, I wanted to have that aesthetic, but. Um, Essentially, I, I wrote the feature script and I did what a lot of people do where you write like a short version oh, of it and, and try to put it out there. But that, that one, uh, yeah, that one was really proud of. It was the first thing I put together when I came to LA. Nice, nice. So see, you even, you, you even write, write horror too. <laughs> I, I actually used to be more like uh, more of the, the make my own kind of content kind yeah. of guy. I was like that for a while. I've actually only focused on acting for about four years. And I know some people that do both. I don't know how. As an actor, 
I'm always like prepping for a role or auditioning. The idea of like trying to also put my own content together, I, I don't know how people do it, you know? So I, I, I had to make that switch from like creator to let me act in other people's things, you know? Exactly. But I might, I might go back one day, you know? I, those juices, they're always, they're always gonna be there. It's just how much attention do you give them, you know? Um, so I, I think I would, I would like to go back to that, hopefully okay. after having more success in the acting world and nice. some more money too. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, yeah, that, and I, yeah, yeah, that doesn't hurt. That doesn't hurt. Because yeah, I, I don't mind, hurt. there's some of my short films, you know, I, I would save up. I've always been a paycheck to paycheck, but I would find a way to save up like five grand and, you know, get everything together. So mm -hmm. it's, it's always doable. It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. Oh, I'm sure. Know? Yeah. Because yeah. like a lot, of, a lot of people think that when they they start doing films or shorts or whatever, like they they're gonna make bank right off the start, and then the real world hits, and you're like, oh my god, I really I'm not making what I thought I'm gonna be making, and then that's when it hits them, and they have to make a decision if they want to scratch and claw and try to yeah. make money fr from from acting or go do something else that's i think that's why they they, they say that you really have to love it because you're, yeah. you're going to come up against that where you're giving so much more than you're getting back you know and if you don't really love it then you'll 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 face that and and, and nine times out of ten people make the decision to leave um mm -hmm. or, or, or take a break um yeah yeah that, that's something it's good to have optimism to a point because yeah, it's like exactly. you, you you know the the odds are staggering if you don't have any optimism you know the, you'll just never get off the ground but then if you're so optimistic that you think it's all going to work out in a couple years um a crushed hope can send you back and, and that's make true you know, uh, i know actually um one of the shorts I worked on, uh, just a few, a few things went really bad, and uh, they went, they went really sideways, and it affected the project. It affected the way I felt about it. I didn't make the decision then to not do any more short films, but uh, I decided to focus on comedy. Um, oh, okay. Because I know in comedy you can kind of flip. You can have, you can have details that, oh, the continuity isn't right. Whatever, you know, uh, or the special effects don't look that good, or something like that. And people don't care as long as the joke lands, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. whereas in trauma, you're trying to get lost in this world. And if you have, if you have too many mistakes, you know, people are out there they check out. And I, I can't blame them because I, I would check out too, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I've, I've come up against that, that in smaller ways where I've, I've kind of asked, like, is, is this worth the effort? You know, not the entirety of pursuing a film career, but certain mm -hmm. aspects I found myself doing exactly that where I just kind of go, um, for now, this isn't for me, you know, yeah. like it's, yeah, you, you figure out what's, what's too tough. And what, I guess maybe like a boxer trying to figure out what weight class, like, right. okay, tried heavyweight, got my ass kicked. Let's try that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I wa wanted to ask you like, what drew you to want to get, into the world of 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 acting and like what what was your job you had before you became an actor that made that you know you you, you were like oh this isn't for me i'm gonna leave this job and go follow my dream um well a big part of it actually is a little bit about like what we were talking about when when you're a kid and you, mm -hmm. you watch the same movie over and over um i was definitely like that i didn't have any brothers or sisters and my parents worked at night so i, I was definitely like a tv kid you know and so it, it just i remember seeing some of the actors like like night of the demons or something and yeah. sometimes i'd wonder like who are these people you know and then thankfully imdb came out you know but when i was a kid they didn't have uh they didn't have internet until i was like 18 or something um, but when I was a little kid, 
it, it was just it was so interesting to see these people's faces and and know that they had lives and mm. i thought how interesting would that be if one day there was a kid that watched the movie i was in over and over and over and over and over and they'll always know my face i'll always live somewhere in their brain right. um so i know it sounds weird but as a kid i think i was part of the goal was um having some kind of vain attempt at immortality like this form will not live beyond, you know, 80 years or whatever. But if I can live in your brains, live on the celluloid, then, then there's something to that. Um, so that, that was definitely a big, big part of it for me. I like the idea of uh, that it's forever. Mm. And it's a big reason why I never got too much into the theater. Um, okay. There weren't a lot of film opportunities where I grew up. So I ended up doing theater. But then I always felt like it was such a shame that you put... So, and not, not just you, but everybody, cast, crew, puts all this work and then someone, someone could have taped it with their like mini DV, but it's just <laughs> not the same. It never is. Even if, even if it's high quality, it's just never the same. And so I thought, what a shame that you put all this and then it just kind of evaporates to time and it goes away. So I think one thing I loved about film is it lasts forever. And well, you and I can still watch like a Stanley Kubrick movie and head, but we, we got to see how he thinks, you know, and I, I just, I, I always thought the, the immortality of it was really cool. Um, and then I suppose as I got older, yeah, the idea of like being a Charlie Sheen, like, yeah, party chicks, you know, before he started going crazy. But, you know, <laughs> when, when he was the fun kind of crazy instead of like the messy kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I got to be like 20, I thought that just being like rich and famous and getting all the girls sounded pretty good. Hey, that, I gonna, if that's a way good. in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and but they, they, I guess they say that, <laughs> that um, we all come to the theater for the wrong reasons, but we stay for the right reason. Mm -hmm. And I guess it explains, you know, I'm married and yet I still want to do this. So I was like, I guess it wasn't all about the Coke and chicks, you know, but it was somewhere <laughs> yeah. in the mix, the why. Um, and, but also like th being on a film set too, like, even if you're, you're just pretending, I like the idea that like, you know, you have this life, you know, I'm, I'm married, I live in Sherman Oaks, uh, my hobbies are this, you have this life. And then, but for a little bit, you can live a different life. Yes. And R Robert De Niro said that, he said like, part of why I want to act is my steadfast refusal to live only one life or some paraphrasing like hell, but, um, I, I was like, I definitely responded to that where it, it was like, for a while you get to just pretend. And as kids, you play pretend all the time. I, I certainly did. You, our video games weren't as cool. You know, <laughs> we only have two buttons, A and B. I know, so I, think I know exactly. You play for an hour or two, then you're done. And maybe if they had Call of Duty, I wouldn't have been as <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh yeah, video, um, video so games back in the day was... We, we had to use our imagination. Exactly. Because, exactly. You know, but now, I, didn't, I didn't play video games for 20 years. Then the <laughs> pandemic happened, and I was like, what, what's, what's this Xbox thing? <laughs> and then I see the graphics, the attention, uh -huh. and I'm like, oh, my God. You're like, wait a minute. If, this, if they this, had this isn't stuff. what I used to play. <laughs> uh-huh. I used to play just stick figures. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was a 20-year hiatus. Like, I wasn't oblivious. You know, you see commercials. I know oh, stuff's yeah, out course. there, but when I started playing, I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Like, this this is something else. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, that, that idea of just really being in a different space, like, oh, I could be in a spaceship. I could, you know, and I think I had a job that was really boring working in film on the post-production. And oh. just a lot of time staring at the screen and uh but doing eight years of that I think it did make me realize like I, I was I was meant to be like in the world I was meant to be seen not shut away in the mm -hmm. dark you know uh and there's times like I'd be editing my own films and getting getting lost in the minutiae of it and like staring at a screen it's okay to do from time to time but for my nine to five uh yeah you, yeah you don't, you don't uh, I just I just realized behind the camera yeah yeah that that was a big part of it and i guess I, I didn't really maybe know that until i i saw time slipping away mm -hmm. and, and feeling like something was wrong like i wasn't a part of me you know wasn't complete yeah 
and I guess sometimes that's life. Like you, you have to make the wrong decision. That's true. To make, to make you realize like, ah, that wasn't right. That wasn't right. You know, it's, it's better if you get it right the first time, but it's, it's better to course correct than yeah. continue to be miserable. Yeah, too, exactly. You know, um, so yeah, I, I was, uh, I was kind of at this impasse where I'd been in LA for a while, but I'd really just been kind of working and every once in a while putting my own project together mm -hmm. and um, every once in a while getting cast in things. Uh, but, but really I did, I realized like I need a moment where I can give, give it my all. So it, it was really scary, but yeah, at 36 years old, I was like, I'm just going to quit. I don't know <laughs> what, what I'm going to do. That, 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 that was the scariest thing I've ever done to not know where, you know, I had bills, I had car payment, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. rent, no roommates. Like, like if it's like, if I don't make money, that's like two grand every month, like bam, yeah. bam, bam. So it, it was frightening, but I just realized like, before I say, okay, it didn't work out, I give up. I, I needed to have that one moment where I was able to give it my all and not, okay. not be distracted by, you know, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's one thing that I tell a lot of, uh, new actors, uh, is like, you don't, don't do it right away. Not as soon <laughs> as you get to LA, but, but find a way where you treat it like college and you say, this is what I do and I'm willing to go into debt over it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you don't mm -hmm. have parents to help you out or any kind of support structure, because the truth is, you know, when I would find myself uh, in an audition on a Tuesday, a lot of those actors, they, they, yeah, they had some kind of safety net. That's how oh, they yeah, could be there somewhere, not at work on a Tuesday and then go to, well, you know, lunch after and, and just sort of like, oh, you know, not everybody, not everybody. But I noticed that a lot of the people that I'd see in auditions, they didn't seem to have my problem where it's like, fuck, my boss wants me back in an hour. They didn't seem to have that. Yeah. And I was like, I need to be like you guys, you know, I don't know how, but I need to find a way where I can really come in and focus and not not feel like I'm squeezing in my dream on a lunch break. <laughs> you know, I was like, that needs to be over. So that <laughs> that was about five years ago, um, and I'm I'm still in the fight. Uh, I, I haven't I haven't reached Robert Downey Jr. level status. I'm not rolling okay. in the dough, but I'm I'm doing what I want to do. I, I'm about financially, I'm about as, as well as I was when I had a regular full-time oh, nice. job. Nice. It's just, uh, it's, it, yeah, I'm about there. I was better off with the steady paycheck, but that's not surprising. And a lot of it too is just the psyche. Like, it's scary to look at a, a calendar and it's blank, <laughs> you know, and rent's due in two weeks. Like, it's, it's scary. I've just found in, uh, something always works out something always works out you know and uh so i'm just blessed for that and if it ever comes to the day where i do have to you know hang it up yeah i know that i was in the fight fully oh, you know yeah, for not just one year but but a few and, and that some of the experiences that i've had the people that i've met it's it's really been amazing so i, I don't i don't want to give up i want to keep pursuing it i want to keep growing but it is kind of nice to know that if I had to walk away, I like, it's my fears didn't come true. Where I guess my fear was that if I left my financial security, I was just going to get bulldozed in like three months. I was like, oh, that job wasn't standing in your way. You just suck. <laughs> you know, like I was, that was my big fear. Like, okay, so now I'm a middle aged man who left his job and that didn't work out. So I'm really glad it didn't play out that way. Uh, no matter what, that didn't happen. You know, like I, I, I hung in on the industry for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I used to only do commercial and, and, now, and now I'm doing more of the kind of work that I want to do, you know, and some of that is, is just focusing. But I think also it's, it's good for an actor. Maybe, yeah, your first year, just do everything. Do it. Anyone who will right. hire you, just do it, right. do it, do it. Then start to figure out what your need is, you know? Okay. Okay. Sorry for rambling. No, nah, no. Nah, this is this is like really really good because like you know it, it's it, it's good for someone to hear this like someone who who's starting out and trying to break into the world of acting like it it's good to hear like these things pointers and stuff that you're you're telling everyone. 
I, I hope so, because that it certainly wasn't my impression, like of all the things that I read and all that before I came to L.A., they, they kind of didn't tell you that that is actually your biggest obstacle. You cannot be in two places at once. Yeah. So how do you pay your bills so you can stay in L.A., but then don't have the thing that allows you to pay your bills keep you from auditioning now there's a lot more of these like uber and, and gig based things mm -hmm. now where you don't have a boss you can kind of make your own schedule unfortunately when i was kind of up against it it wasn't really like that it was well like yeah exactly. job or not 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 much in between exactly um, so so the, the the grounds are getting a little bit better and also with technology there's more like self-taped auditions so they're i think it's allowing people to maybe not have to be as drastic as I did, where I just threw myself off a cliff and said, here we go. You know, I guess you probably don't have to as, as much now with, with the way that the industry has changed. But honestly, I still recommend it um, because your energy, even if, uh, even if you have the time to do it, like I said, squeezing it on a lunch break, do you really feel yeah. like anything you squeeze in on a lunch break? Do you really <laughs> feel like that you're giving it your energy? It's like you do have the time, but you're also being pulled in so many directions. So if you can just find one moment to focus on what you want and see how that treats you, you know, see how that goes. But again, I don't recommend doing that your first year. You should get to know, you know, don't do it right away. <laughs> Even though the irony is most people that when they get here, they don't have a job. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, it seems like that would be the best time to attack it before I get weighed down before, but the truth is you need to learn about the city and the way things work and stuff. But, but I'd, I'd say after a while, once you get your feet wet and if you feel like, you know, you're ready emotionally, your talent is ready, then yeah, I think you got to find a way to give it, give it that, give it your all, you know, it isn't anything know, worth it in the, at the end of the day, you know, definitely like, to take as long, as long as you're happy doing it, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's another interesting thing actually about, because some people say, well, why do you like acting? And people say, oh, it's fun. And I never really liked that. Um, yeah. I, I do have fun on set. There's something like that, but I'm like, oh no, roller coasters are fun. Trampolines are fun. <laughs> but what I, what I, what I say acting, it's, it's more like, it's, it's rewarding. You know, when, uh -huh. when the project comes out and you're like, we did, that's, so I'm like, I feel the, a sense of rewarding, but honestly, nine times out of 10 on set, no, I'm memorizing my lines, I'm getting notes from the drive. Right. It's not fun. <laughs> I think I'm to pay you, it's not fun. You know? <laughs> it's not that, you know, like, if, if you could be doing an improv scene with another actor and you both laugh, like, <laughs> it can be fun, but so can any job sometimes. You know, yeah. maybe you like your cubicle mate at your nine to five, sometimes you have a laugh, I but mean, it doesn't mean that are never your fun. job is fun. <laughs> No. no, and I worked. I worked at a media company. Like it still wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, although I guess it was probably more fun than other desk jobs. It was probably more fun than other desk jobs. True, true. I, true. I, I, I always hate that one. Like, why do you act? Because it's fun. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, I find mostly people that say it's fun. They're they're not usually like real actors. Yeah, know? yeah. But there's many, there's many reasons, but I I think what they try to mean is that, that there's this sense. There's a, there's a sense of fulfillment to it that you don't necessarily get with every job. I know I didn't with most of my jobs. I was just trying to fulfill a paycheck. And, well, yeah, I know. That's, all, I guess, that's all it really is, yeah. Yeah. I, the most you hope for, I think, with those kind of jobs is that you don't hate it. Yes, and that's exactly. what I was wanting to settle for is like, I don't hate it, do I? I'm not miserable. Mm -hmm. I always feel like in life, if, if you are miserable, you got to find a way to change. If you're miserable. You're right. You're right about Most that. People don't like your jobs, but hopefully you're not miserable. You know, like, I think that's a good target that people could aim for in, in those circumstances. It's like, try not to be absolutely miserable if you can. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Try not to be miserable. <laughs> And um, you're in one, you're in a, a, a short film and based off one of my favorite video games, Street Fighter, and you play one of the leads in that short. 
Yes, that's actually um, that's actually one that I I put together. Oh, okay. Um, and some of uh, I I played Ryu, I played Wolverine, I played Iron Man in these projects that I put together. So this the decision that I made with the um, <clears throat> with the project that kind of tainted my tastes. <laughs> the uh, it was a drama, and I said, yeah, I'm not going to do drama anymore. So I'm only going to do comedy. And then um, it was pretty interesting because I was thinking like, well, I don't know. I think I was like 33 when I was when I was doing those shorts. Um, I was kind of thinking like, I don't know if I'll ever be hired to play Wolverine or Iron Man by like the big studios and probably not Ryu either. Um, so I, I was kind of thinking an opportunity for me to play these characters would have to be in some kind of comedy because there's, okay. there's a law in terms of intellectual property that if you parody something, then it's, it's fine. But if, if you actually try to make it like really part of the canon, then I'm sure you've seen it. Sometimes they let it slide. Other times it's like, nope, YouTube, please crush it. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, I didn't even necessarily want to do the comedy with these characters, but I was like, it's a great way to not have Capcom say, take that down. <laughs> you know, or, or Fox with Wolverine saying, take that down. So I had to find a way to make these things funny. And someone had a meme that it was like Ryu and it said like, have a Hadoukan attitude. Nice. I thought that was funny. And nice. then I, I, I kind of built around that. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, uh, Ryu's a little older, um, you know, still, still tough. Uh, but what if he was kind of a bit of a narcissist, kind of like any celebrity that reaches, has an ego, um, and so instead of fighting, now he's in the self-help kind of Tony Robbins sort of arena. Uh, so I, I, I just kind of became fascinated with, with that, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's where it kind of came from. And then, and then the idea of like, what are the other street fighters up mm -hmm. to? And yeah, it, it was, it was kind of fun. That, that was the cheapest one I ever did. I think <laughs> I, I only spent like 500 bucks. But, really? but I was like, it was still pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have my own green screen and everything. Wow. Um, whereas my, my other projects, they were usually closer to like 5,000. Not a lot in, you know, if you, there's people that'll put 100 into a short film, you know. Um, so by those standards, still not a lot. But for, for a nine to fiver that's living paycheck to paycheck, it's, yeah. you know, for me. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But it's, it was that strange thing I noticed probably what a lot of like YouTubers and Snapchatters and TikTokers notice is that a higher budget isn't always a higher, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't always translate, especially with comedy like we're talking about. A joke's a joke, you know, does it land or not, you know? Oh, I know. <laughs> and, and you oh, also... You throw... oh. <laughs> and, you also were what well, now were you in the men in black film or was it a short oh that uh that was that was really really interesting um i'm not in the men in black it was for men in black international um okay. and it was actually lexus and sony sony owns the rights to the movie uh and then lexus was doing kind of a cross promotion and so they were looking to do a prank um, where basically they have this uh, car salesman and then they, they took the guy that played the car salesman and made like a, a, a mannequin out of him. They hollowed out his stomach and then the stomach opens up and there's this little <laughs> alien guy in here and it's like a spaceship in there. So the <laughs> shit was wild. Um, they, they wanted to keep it really secret. It was the same uh, company they did the Devil Baby sketch. Okay. I don't know if you remember that one. It was like there's like a baby that comes out and it looks pretty real oh they did one uh the telekinesis sketch in the light it was like a library or a starbucks where they actually had like stuntmen on wires to fly nice. up against walls and stuff and so everyone that was there at the cafe they just see books flying across <laughs> but everything was rigged so that this actress could kind of do it so anyway they they did all these really cool like viral prank sketches and They'd seen some of my uh, stuff from like Escape the Night. And I think uh, my my comedy reel has lots of different characters. Mm -hmm. I got Christopher Walken and then Wolverine and then Tony Stark. And then, you know, so 
And when you watch my reel, you get hit with like 30 different voices. So, nice. and some of them, they're obviously kind of improv. Well, yeah, yeah. And so I think they saw that in me, a guy that can do lots of voices and improv. Because when you're dealing with real people from the street, there's no script. You know, it's kind of more Sasha Baron Cohen, like Borat kind of act. You're right, like, you're right. You sort of have it in your head where you want to take it, but they might not take the bait. They might not <laughs> go where you want them to go. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great project for that. Um, and uh, so, so they hired me and I actually learned how to control the little alien dude. Nice. In, in the, in nice. The thing. And so it was like puppetry. And then I would be like, and I had this monitor so I could see what they see. And uh, I basically just made the alien come out. Um, <laughs> the only thing that was a little interesting is the producers hired me because my sense of humor is pretty rough. Um, it's gotten better because I realized we live in more delicate times. Uh, but yeah, I, I had a sense of humor that was closer to like Tosh or South Park. Like it, okay. it bordered on the very room, uh, which as we see nowadays, you make a joke and you get canceled or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how it was. They hired me specifically because I'm kind of a foul sense of humor kind of guy. And then uh, when I started getting foul, uh, not that I was dropping f bombs, just some of the things I said were a bit like racy. Uh, then, uh, yeah, the the suits kind of came down and said, "Hey, don't say that! Don't say that!" But it was it was interesting. I kind of um, had my my first interaction with that kind of censorship right there. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that. But then also, like any actor, you, you have to take a note from the director or sometimes the producer or the studio head. But either way, they're above you. They're above you. So you well, yeah, of course you have to answer um, to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, well, every once in a while you hear about, like, stars pushing back. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't, I don't have that kind of clout. Um, and I think sometimes what actors do is you see it where they're, all, they're also a producer. I think that's, it's primarily not just financial, but so that they can push back. They say, yeah. my, my character wouldn't do that. They actually can push back because they're a producer. But, uh, yeah, so... I actually just sort of, I took it in, in, I was a little disappointed where I'm like, uh, and it got pretty bad. I was like, they said, keep it PG. And I'm like, you guys are talking about keeping it G, G, not PG. Like, um, <laughs> but then uh, that's part of what acting is too. Like you want to play it a certain way. And then the director says, this character is actually more sad. And yeah. Right. Like, oh. yeah. And so it's up to you, it's up to you to find that and whatever vision you had, you know, throw it out. And so I, I try to look at that as a challenge, like, because I think I've used that kind of rude uh, humor as kind of like a crutch a little bit, you know, um, just because it has more of a shock value. So kind of like trying to be witty without being offensive. I, I try, I just took it in stride, like, okay, uh, let's, let, let's narrow it in. Uh, but either way, yeah, that, that was a hell of an experience. That nice. was great. Nice. I uh, did some people on YouTube, fun. this gets better than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, a lot of people probably feel that. There, there's like a lot of short films that I found that, you, you know, are based on the movie that were actually better than the movie. It's, and I think honestly, <laughs> not, not to get on the whole like suits and heads of studios, I, mm -hmm. but I think there was this kind of, there was a story about the making of Predator where yeah. a guy wrote a script, Predator, boom. And then it went through the studio uh, gauntlet where uh, head writers and producers and all that started to look at it. And they would add their own thing. You're like, oh, it needs to be sexier and add this note and add this mm -hmm. note. And it went through a billion rewrites. And then the director, John McTiernan, saw the, you know, version 20. And he was just like, this is a fucking mess. Let me see the first version. And then he read the first one and he said, we're going to do that. So those 19 versions just went right out the window. Oh my God. And they went right back to the original. So I think sometimes why, why a short film might have more impact than the feature, I think it might be exactly because of that. Because it's one person's vision. That's, that's not true. filtered that's through true. what we think we'll like. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to say like, well, we're trying to appeal to this demographic. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's business. But 
But I think that's why sometimes things end up having this kind of generic, like, oh, it's not bad, but it's not know. good either. I know, but exactly. There's a journey to a short film when it's like, it's my vision. I wrote it, I directed it. We're doing it in three days and then it is what it is. Sometimes that can be like astounding. And I think it's, it's because it's like, we're using the first version of the script, not right. 20, you know, right. it's been like pieces. Hmm. Yeah, like there, there's so many like, Friday, the third, thirteenth fan films that are so good, and it, it's crazy. And the actors they got to play Jason is very big and intimidating. And and I, I'm like really a fan of a lot of the Jason shorts. I think I, that's why I think it's great. I hate it when the studios kind of clamp down on on fan films. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I it's it's weird after some of the reasons why. I like I said I played Wolverine and Iron Man because yeah. I was like I, I don't know if they'll ever hire me to do yeah, it. Exactly. So I'll keep myself. After that, uh, there was a YouTuber and she has something like 13 million subscribers, and uh, I did two sketches for her. One is Wolverine, really? one is Iron Man, and God, one of them was up to like 36 million views. And I think the other one's like a solid 20, and so they're like oh fan God. films. But again, they're like fun. they're comedy, so they're kind of protected. With the parody thing wow um but yeah so like, like mine 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 was satisfying because i actually took it like on the festival circuit and i watched it on the big screen nice. with wow. people and i heard them laugh and and so it was rewarding and not in that way but it didn't really it didn't go viral or anything like that okay but the ones that i did for uh a youtuber they did and oh, okay. in some ways that was really satisfying Wow. Yeah, yeah, and, awesome. and so the, the fan thing, uh, I never thought I'd get into that, but I just, for me, I thought of it as a way to play some characters that that maybe I wouldn't get the chance to play. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so I started getting more and more into the fan film world, seeing what other nice. people do. I think it's great, yeah. Because what, what else would people do? They'd be like, oh, I like Batman, so I'll make a character <laughs> like Batman, in a, you know? and. And it's like, yeah, just do it. Do, yeah, do the real Batman. You yeah, know? and it's great. <laughs> nice. So, um, so, like, what songs do you like? Like, what's on your playlist? Ooh, that that one's rough for me. Um, you, you know, know when people sing, right? <laughs> I really do, though. I really do. I know everyone says that, but then you see, yeah, you see their playlist, and it's like, not really. Yeah. You know, it's all metal or it's all rap or whatever. Um, yeah, the, the only things I don't listen to too much of is uh, country music. Um, I, I like I like some metal, but definitely can't do too much. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be like country, the really heavy metal. And then some of the really crazy, like, bassy dubstep kind of okay, techno. Yeah, okay. I like electronic music. The ones that sound like robots fucking, yes. that, that, that starts to be like, ow, you know, like, uh, uh, does anyone like this? Um, yeah, yes, I, I like soundtrack music, um, but I guess uh, probably some of my favorite, I, I, I like The Killers, I like Arcade Fire, uh, Diplo, um, I like Sia a lot, uh, and rap. Uh, I like rap a lot, but I don't necessarily have too many because it, it's changed over the years. Okay. You know? I was actually I was actually really big into DMX. Nice. And so, yeah, when he passed, I was like, oh, man. And it does feel weird when you have all these people like pretending to care just because it's the flavor of the right, day. Cause he right, passed. Exactly. Oh, man, I really I mean, uh, I think I listened to It's Dark and Hell is Hot when I was like 18. Um, so it wasn't something from my childhood, but it was nice. from like my adolescence. And uh, yeah, I just remember thinking like, man, who, who has like, like that amount of energy? You found out right. later it's because he was always on crack, but <laughs> that didn't matter at the time. It was just like, this guy's ferocious, <laughs> you know, like he had, he had like a punk rock sort of anger <laughs> and, <laughs> and like energy, but it was within the hip hop genre, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, so actually, it's it's weird to say, but yeah, DMX was actually one of my one of my favorites. Oh, you know, man, his, awesome. his his album kind of went down a little bit as yeah. you know, but there was always going to be something to like on on every album. Uh, 
but and then there's there's a newer I don't, I don't even know if you'd call it rap and maybe that's what is a great segue have you ever heard of saint john you know what no no it's uh, um he, he did a couple viral hits uh and it's it really is it's out there sometimes he sounds like lenny kravitz oh, wow, other times really? it sounds closer to like more traditional hip-hop but we're, we're seeing more and more where, like like billy eilish will do something yeah. that'll sound something like marilyn manston yeah and then she'll do something that sounds more hip-hop yeah, so you see people playing with genres now and i think that's great oh, but yeah, that's why is. sometimes it's hard to say like, oh, I like this artist, but I don't even know what genre you call it. You even hear like a little reggae. In there. What about you? Um, me, mostly rock and metal, like some, some like dance, dance music. Like, you know, I'll go from listening to like Aerosmith and Marilyn Manson and Poison and bands like that. And then I'll go and listen to Paula Abdul and Cher. <laughs> So, I like uh, I never got too much into share. Uh, I liked I liked some Paula Abdul though, especially when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, there was some Paula Abdul songs that were just like, yeah. And Marilyn she Manson looks like amazing some yet. Still, Paula Abdul. Oh, man. she she like found the fountain of youth. Like she looks exactly like she did in the eighties. Like her her body oh, wow. is amazingly in shape and. She just looks really amazing, and I, I, I was just in shock when I see how she looks wow. now compared to, to back then. <laughs> you know, now that you mention it, uh, yeah, she was in, uh, was it the first Borat movie? And that wasn't yeah. that long ago, and you're yeah, right. She yeah, she looked, she looked great. Yeah. Some people are that lucky jeans. I know. I was, I was really, really, really into Nine Inch Nails. Um, nice. Probably nice. like the age of, like, to 26 love nine inch nails and um but then 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 i don't know if like the music changed or if i did because a lot of my friends that were very very loyal nine inch mm -hmm. fan they didn't see what i see saw that i i felt like it was uh, you know kind of like oh it hit a peak and then each album was kind of becoming a little bit less impressive that's how i felt okay they didn't okay. feel that way at all you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like, okay. Um, but I still respect, like, he does He does scores. And, and so I respect the talent. I just feel like maybe the music doesn't hit me the way it used to. Mm -hmm. You know, And may maybe in some ways, like, the kind of music he was doing, maybe it was meant for that kind of teenage angst. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then it kind of loses its potency a little bit, you know? Yeah. But I still respect the musicianship, the artistry. I'm not. I'm not saying that like it's bad. I just feel like maybe it doesn't like touch me the way it used to. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> but it's, it's it's interesting. Like um, I, I feel like like DMX. Like I didn't I didn't grow up in, in the Bronx or or go to jail well, yeah, or, of course, or uh, have of course. the experiences. But the fact that sometimes you can still relate to the energy of it. Mm -hmm. not not the world the literal but kind of just the energy of it i was like that's that's art you know that's it's human beings connect oh no i know you know even girl nice. <laughs> and um like where can fans find you at like with your socials and if you have a tiktok and all that stuff a website <laughs> I I just joined tiktok um uh, <laughs> about a month ago and didn't really use it and then I remembered I, I've done a few like of those viral sketches with like mm -hmm. famous TikTok stuff. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. I kind of didn't want to do like, I didn't want one more thing to worry about, but sometimes you got to see where, the, your, where things are trending. You well, know? yeah, like, exactly. Imagine if you, if you stayed on MySpace, it's like, you know? uh so <laughs> so i was like all right let me let me look into that uh but mostly i'm on i'm on instagram that you know uh so i'm, I'm at uh ryan manuel underscore actor on on instagram i definitely uh i'm better at, at keeping update there I, I usually don't go more than maybe three days without having some kind of like update so i i basically i used to have a website and i was like oh why bother just use instagram that's what yeah. you know like I know a lot of actors that have websites and I'm like, uh, it, it'll come in handy sometimes, you know, hey, look at my stuff. But really, I feel like to engage, yeah, you're better off using social media. Oh, and definitely. it's more fun. 
Definitely, yeah. Absolutely, you know. <laughs> and, and um, like, what, is there anything coming out next that you're allowed to to talk about? Like, do you have anything coming out you want to plug? Sure, sure. Um, I have a couple of features coming out. Uh, one of them is called Plight. Um, it's a thriller uh, based on revenge. Uh, so it, it's uh, hard to explain, but it's a really, really interesting story, kind of about five people that all have their own motivations, and the whole movie kind of builds towards this head, and uh, I really fell in love with the script. A lot of what it does is kind of um, tactical morality, you know, without being preachy and, and over the head, but really the subtext of it is, it really makes you wonder like, what is the right thing to do? Or oh, wow. how do you view it? And it made me think a little bit of Game of Thrones where, nice. you know, you have Jamie Lannister where for the first three seasons, he was like the bad guy. And then we, we creep up to about season seven and he's like the hero um <laughs> and and it all it's just all kind of changes how you you look at it and i play a character similar to that where you begin to look at him as the bad guy and then okay. as time goes on maybe not uh so that that was really uh interesting to do um and then i'm in another film called cats of the bayou which we shot in New Orleans. That was really great. Right before the pandemic, uh, oh. that should be releasing. Um, but it's about uh, cat people, and so this kind of it's culty without being like horrific and weird, you know. But th these people are kind of all in their own in their own world, and you know uh, they have their Egyptian cat gods and all that. But mostly, mostly though, it's about just what they have to do. They go about their 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 day and enter the plot. But it's in the background of everything. Like that's nice. that's who these people are. Uh, so those are those are two features that I've got that are coming out soon. I did I did a feature that would have been coming out, but it's about Easter, and he didn't finish it in time for this Easter. So I was like it's gonna be Easter twenty twenty two. Like all right, <laughs> I get it. You know, it's like it's like it's like releasing a Christmas movie on Fourth of July. You just yeah, exactly. It. Sometimes we, we're we're beholden to you know, external events. So it was disappointing, but I understood. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough Easter movies out there, you know? I, there really isn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a couple horror films where the Easter Bunny's a killer, so... That's actually right, that's actually right where my mind went, too. Yeah. I was like, if there is an Easter movie, it's probably horrific. It's, it's probably it's, like yeah. tongue in cheek. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I'm, I, mean, I don't want to take up a lot of your time. I know, I know, it's been been a while already. So, just want to thank you for coming on the show and have oh, a good yeah, night and good happy. weekend and all that fun sure. stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. And hey, man, I'll be I'll be sure to reach out as soon as those things drop. Okay. Okay, definitely. Definitely. Sweet. Love to have you back on. Awesome, man. Cool. Sweet. All right. Well, have a good night, brother. All right, buddy. You too, man. Cool. See you later. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>